Hello, hello. This is Jake Light Gaming Lawyer at your service. We're once again back with the great Ace Attorney. And we're going to find out what is the correlation with the two evidence. The overcoat, the disc and the small box. I think it is very obvious. But the thing is, Ace Attorney game is the fact that you have to be very, very specific with the evidence. If not, you will fail. Yes, of course. You and I know both. No, both. Yeah, no. Yeah, both know that. We know Miss Big Gilded's true character, and we know that this is significant. Even if we do not know why. But if we explain all that to the court at this point, we will have to acknowledge that Miss Gilded's acquittal two months ago was a mistake. That the defense argument was flawed, based on false information. Oh no! And then what that would mean, admitting that Gina committed perjury. But Genie, could it be that Von Zix knows? Is that why he's doing this now? Because he anticipated everything. But maybe this could be a great opportunity for us. Sorry, what do you mean, Iris? Well, what is it that you always say, Runo? Sooner or later, the truth comes out every time. All right, the exact significance of these things that McGilded deposited with Mr. McGilded is something that only Jinna can explain to the court. But if I put her on the sand to testify about that, it could critically damage our chances of winning this case. What's the right thing to do here? If Jinna testify. My lord, the defense would like to make a proposal. Oh, what proposal, counsel? While well, the court awaits the arrival of Mick Gilded's small box, I would like to call the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, to the witness stand. The defendant? To what end? It's to do with the various articles deposited at Windybank's by Mr. by Mr. Mick Gilded, my lord. Miss Lestrade has information relating to them. I believe it would be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. It will prove the significance of the articles in question once and for all. Well, well, things are becoming interesting. I presume you've considered the implications of the testimony you're proposing. In particular, the impact it will have on the accused's standing in, the, in your own. I have. Lord Van, Lord Van Zee, Lord Von Zeex. Would you care to explain that last remark? Uh, the prosecution accepts the defense proposal. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witness and hear from the accused herself. Very well, if you have no objection. So, the court will now hear the testimony of the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. You witness, you witnesses currently in the stand may step down until further notice. Then I shall, then I shall bid you good day. Wait, you, sir, shall remain in the sand while Miss Lestrade testifies. As you wish. Alright then, Gina, it's time. I know this will be hard, but please, put your faith in me, right here. Good luck, Bruno. ba 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 the articles that Mr. McGilder had deposited in Winnibank's pawn brokery are intimately related with the Omnibus case, the trial which was heard in this courtroom two months ago. Yes, and I remember this young lady being brought before me in the trial as well. That's right, my lord. Her testimony helped to establish the innocence of the defendant, Mr. McGilder. 
The omnibus case was intriguing, to say the least. And now here we all are again. The same players in that trial facing each other once more. A twist of fate, perhaps, my Nipponese friend. Oh, allow me to recap the events of two months ago. An old brickmaker was stabbed to death in an omnibus running along Wyndon's winter streets. Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the carriage, Mr. McGilded. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder. But as the trial progressed, another possibility emerged. That the murder in fact took place above the defendant's head on the roof deck, with the body then being dropped through the skylight into the carriage below. It was Miss Lestrade whose testimony brought that possibility to the light. At the time of the incident, Miss Lestrade was concealed under a seat in the carriage, hoping to pick the pockets of unsuspecting passengers. Then, immediately after the trial, having been acquitted of the murder, Mr. McGilder died in this very courtroom, in the most extraordinary of circumstances. A mystery that remains unsolved even now, two months on, as indeed this does the omnibus murder itself. Be that as it may, I recall neither that this nor the small box being mentioned in the court of those proceedings. Miss Lestrade, would you tell the court now, please? It's okay, it's just perjury. It is not death penalty. <laughs> what really happened in the omnibus two months ago, I mean? I don't know what you mean! I already say all of what I know! And what about everything you told us yesterday from inside your prison cell? Please, Miss Lestrade, this is extremely important. But, but... Remember, little girl? If it transpires that you willfully hand withheld information in the trial two months ago, the Home Office will seek to prosecute you for perjury. <gasps> and naturally, you will lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face facts, you have little credibility to lose. Genie, don't listen to him. Please, you have to trust Bruno now. I, Iris, we're on your side. All right then, I'll talk. It's the right choice, Gina. Well, it would seem that my learned friend is hell bent on bringing the entire courtroom down about about his ears. So be it. I must confess, I'm struggling to understand what on earth is happening here. However, it would appear that Mr. McGilded's pawn articles and that extraordinary case of the omnibus harbor secrets of which we have been hitherto unaware. So, Miss Lestrade, you will now give your testimony before the court about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth, a commodity sorely lacking in your original statements. This is it then, everything's going to come out, like Van Zick said. This could bring the whole court, uh, courtroom down about my ears, but as a lawyer, I prepared to take the risk. The real truth of the omnibus case. Truth is that Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the omnibus the whole world of time. When the Irish man dragged me out from the arm seat, I saw that this on the floor. All of a sudden, I heard a scream from me uh, over, head, over me head, and the pair of the roof deck went off to call the slops. That's when Mick Gilder slipped the driver some teens to us run to the pawn shop roundabout. 
He threatened me not to snitch. Not to say nothing to no one about what I seen or heard. Good grief. This is outrageous. What you've just told the court bears almost no resemblance to your testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Then, then there's every chance I may have adjudicated in error in McGill's trial. It sounds very much to me as if the man deliberately deceived his court in an effort to cover up the most wicked of schemes. Without doubt, your lordship is correct. A great injustice was done in the courtroom two months ago. The actions of the accused in their trial of this witness and of my learned friend are entirely inexcusable. I don't believe it. The whole trial was a fast. It was all lies. That big gilded man over to the core. Cool. Don't forget that lawyer from the east. They were all in it all together. You're wrong. Love you. Mrs. Narrow, the lawyer there. He didn't know nothing about it. A bug. I don't think so. I Are we really expected to believe that? He really stitched everything uh, everyone up here. What an operation to keep the man off scot free. Unforgivable. Stop. The lies have to stop. Stop. Yes, the defense made a terrible error of judgment. I intend to take full responsibility and suffer whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. However, it's imperative that the court allows the witness to elaborate on her testimony. Because the true significance of Mikkel's pawn articles must be brought to light. Very well, my learned student friend. Given the depths of calamity you have just plunged yourself into, this may well be worth hearing. Words may fail me. This situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Naruhuru. Yes, my lord. I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Of course, my lord. Fly me, Mr. Naruto. Now, counsel, proceed with your cross-examination. Well, the one who was doing the cross-examination would be the prosecutor, but okay. Still, there's truth that the girl was in the cabin on the main beach the whole time, and the Irishman dragged me out from under seat. I saw the disc on the floor. Was the disc you saw this disc? Yeah, I reckon it probably was. It was right next to the cove lying on the floor. Could this disc have belonged to the victims, perhaps? I don't know. But McGill did pick it up pretty smartish. And then he set the coal with the knife in his belly up on, on seat. What did he say to you at the time? He told me not to say a word about what I seen or heard to no one. About this and all. I was that scared. When he was looking at me I thought, if I didn't go along with it, I'd get stuck with that knife too. <laughs> then he started asking me a load of questions, like what my name was and where I live and that. He asked me about me being a diver too. After a while, what happened in the catcher was noticed. Yeah, that's right. First there was kind of rapping noise. Rapping. Went off the cold slops. That's when we just slipped the driver some team to do a run to the pawn shop around. That pawn shop obviously being Winniebanks on Baker Street. Just a moment, Council. Do, do you mean to tell me that the driver gave false testimony in that trial as well? Perhaps the excursion to the pawnbroker he slipped his mind when he was in the sand. Indeed, Fort Von Ziggs. McGilda took off its coat and gave it to the driver. He folded it up all careful like before handing it over. 
When I saw him do that, I remember thinking, a cold and what's in it gotta be worth a few bob. Yes, Gina was sure that this must be worth more than Mr. Windbag was suggesting, wasn't she? I remember her quibbling with him over the prize that afternoon at the pawn brokery. The driver looked pretty happy when Mick flashed some brass in his face. He went running off at the lick. And the Brock Trotter called me to her and told me to come out from the drag's cabin. He threatened me not to snitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I'd seen or heard. Threatened to you how exactly? Told me I'd only be able to scarper if I did exactly what he'd say. Which, which included giving false testimony in court two months ago. Yeah, that's it. There was one other thing he said. Which was... He told me I have to hang on to the ticket from the shop and make sure not to lose it. The ticket? Well, I never. Say that if he didn't show up to get the ticket off me before two months passed, I had to go to the pawn shop and pay the money to keep it in luck. To stop it being forfeited, he left me with some brass to pay for it. But, re but really, why on earth would Mr. Begooded have such such a thing? Depositing his overcoat with the pawnbroker before the arrival of police, it makes no sense at all. It would seem to be only my one logical explanation, my lord. What McGilder had the driver deposit at Minivanks was something he didn't want the police to see. Something very important that he needed to hide at all costs. Anyway, after that he let me go, so I let it before the coppers showed up. Okay, well done, Gina. It can't have been easy to tell the truth like that. Jenny's sweet, Jenny's sweet. Jenny's really have put her faith in you, Bruno. Yes, and to thank her, she'll have to face a charge of perjury once this trial's over. And to use the time we have now to get as much information out of her as possible. It's time, it's time to really go for it. Press her on every statement. Okay, you should not really just say that. I suppose I should. Oh, and another thing. What's, what's that? <gasps> Take a look at those two. Isn't it strange they've been whispering to each other an entire time? Yes, that's it's very strange and obvious they are colluding with each other. Yeah, it looks like they are having a secret discussion about something. I'm not sure I'm completely comfortable with that. I wonder if there's anything I can do about it. Right, let's press, press every statement then. And you will be hiding in the cabin at the time as well, won't you, Miss Lestrade? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment, underneath one of the seals. Yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you can't see nothing at all. Now, in your testimony two months ago, I feel certain that you claim Mr. McGilder was the sole passenger, did you not? False testimony, miss, my lord. That's, that's what you told me I had to say. But it's important that you tell us the truth now. Well, Mr. McGilder and the victim acquaintances. I don't know. But I did hear him talking a lot. What were they talking about? Well, I couldn't hear too well, but if I had to say... I think it was about money or something. They kept talking about buying and not buying. Perhaps business dealing is of some kind. Well, anyway, they got louder and louder. It started to sound like a proper fight. I was pretty scared by then. I lit dared to breathe. And all of a sudden, I heard noise like someone keeling over the floor. It was blooming loud and all. Then I believe you let out an involuntary scream. Yeah, and what gave me away? Hold it. What's this disc you saw? Oh, wait, I already questioned this. Sorry. 
Good, 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 good. Skip this part, shall we? Nothing really I have to talk about now. Wrapping eyes. Yeah, that's gonna press this as well. There were two gentlemen occupying the seats on the roof deck, I believe. That's right. They must have looked down through the skylight and noticed the cove with the knife in his guts. When they screamed, the driver pulled up to the horses and McGilda got me out of sight. Out of sight? Where? Back under the seat where I started off. Once the carriage came to an halt, the two coals from the roof ran off to fetch the slopes. If they immediately left to fetch the police, it would appear they were entirely unrelated to the incident. Hmm. So that left me gilded the driver and still you still at the scene. Yeah, only the driver didn't know I was there because I was under the seat. I heard the cabin door open and a voice from outside. The driver, the driver, yes. He also testified in the trial, I believe. A fellow who went by the name Beppo, if memory serves. What did Mick Gilded and the driver say to each other? I don't know what happened, and stuff like that mainly. Wait, I already questioned this. Can I just spook them? Excuse me. Is there something you'd like to share with the court, Inspector Quixen and Mr. Creighton? Oh, I can. Inspector! Mr. Creighton! Blimey! Blimey! You're trying to give me a heart attack? You have been whispering to each other for quite some time now. Tell us, what is the discussion about? Discussion? With this fella? Or the other one, Sunshine? You think I've got anything to talk about with a shady gent like this? And I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective after he deprived me of that disc that was rightfully mine. But they've clearly been talking the entire time we've been cross-examining Gina. It's as if they've been negotiating. Thank you, Miss Lestrade. Thank you, Counsel. I've heard enough. I believe we now have a reasonable understanding of what actually transpired on the omnibus. It would appear on that night two months ago, a negotiation was taking place on an omnibus. A, nego a negotiation concerning this disc, however, matter did not, did not run smoothly. When the parties involved began to quarrel over price, Big Gilder took what he wanted by force at the expense of the other man's life. Which proves my point. This disc is clearly extremely valuable in some way, although I don't understand why as yet. And two days ago, precisely two months after the omnibus incident, McGilder's, McGilder's code and its contents were due to be forfeited. I didn't know what I should do with the ticket. I mean, the cove died right after his trial. I knew that. So you decided who would try to claim the articles as your own? Well, why not, eh? They were only gonna be forfeited. Why should I have got them? Anyway, you can't blame me for thinking about it. Thinking ain't no crime. Miss Lestrade. It would appear Mr. McGilder was prepared to kill in order to take possession of this disc. Do you know why? Do you know why that would be? Eh, I ain't got a clue. But I reckon it must be worth a fair bit of brass. He was probably gonna sell it. No, he's not gonna sell it. And you can't blame me for thinking that. 
thinking it ain't no crime. It's probably related to the music box somehow. Ooh. My lad! has been locked in a journey when it comes back as I'm gonna do weird voices for the bailiff. I'm just gonna assume it's gonna it's a different person every time. Mysterious little box deposited by me gilded two months ago. There's no doubt in my mind that there's a key piece in this far reaching puzzle. To be continued, to, conti to be continued, continue, to be continued, continue. Oh, 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 we're gonna find out the truth finally. We, it's kind of like we're, yeah, we're reaching to a point where the mystery of our investigations have reached. Now we're gonna learn what's the truth by mixing with the evidence together with the testimonies. The music box, the music box. It's a music box, obviously, god damn it. Uh, so this is the article in question, is it? The small box deposit with with the pawnbroker by Mr. McGilda two months ago. And on the night of Mr. Windbank's murder, the only item on the shelves that was touched by whoever broke into the shop. Quick, quick, let's open it up and see what's inside. Ah ha ha ha! Yep, it's a music box, a hand aid. <laughs> Good gracious, this is no ordinary box, it seems. Wow, although I, in truth, I had an inkling that that would be the case, it would appear that the box houses a miniature music box movement. Then, it is too much to expect. I think. I think it would be reasonable to assume that it is a device for the playback of this disc, my lord. So, here we have the means to play back Mc Mr. McGuder's disc, deposited at Windy Banks at much the same time. Not strictly correct, my lord. It was not Mr. It was not McGuder's disc. It was the disc of his victim in the omnibus. But why, for heaven's sake, are we to understand that the brickmaker was trying to sell this music box disc to Mr. McCure? I believe the answer will come clear if we listen to the music box. Music on the disc, my lord. Yes, very well. Let the court now listen to this curious disc at last. <gasps> Rexon. Wait, my lord. Good grief, what is the meaning of this, Inspector? The music box and the disc are... They are very unrelated to the case. No, no need to spoil the somber atmosphere in the courtroom with some silly bit of music. This disc may very well have motivated the culprit in this case to commit murder. Clearly, this has every chance that it's fundamentally important to understanding what happened. The, pros the prosecution has no objection. But, but no, that piece of evidence is... Clearly, Scotland Yard has some vested interest here. But it is policy of this prosecutor to leave no avenues unexplored and you inspector have no jurisdiction here to prevent that from happening Gah! no further delays please play the disc Ah, uh, <laughs> immediately I know what this means. What, what on earth? That's certainly not what I would call music. No. 
It's just the same note playing over and over again in an irregular sequence. Boom! Ha 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 ha! Mr. Graydon? Mr. Graydon? This. this really is priceless. Heh <laughs> heh. Yeah. After all that, the music box is broken. Broken? No, it can't be, can it? Well, obviously. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised. If the officer sent to fetch it, didn't drop it on the way. Back to the courtroom. Well, with much regret. I feel the court must accept this music box offers little in the way of clues. Are you ready to move on, counsel? Come on. Yes, alright. It does sound as though it's completely broken, but is it? Could this music emanating from the music box possibly be a new clue? It could be a clue. I believe that it could be relevant, my lord. Good lord, but but how can it be? It's an abomination, counsel. Mere noise. I fail to see how it can have any meanings whatsoever. That sounds strange, I agree, but there's one thing bothering me. While Graydon stands there chortling victoriously, the inspector beside him has a rather telling expression on his face. It's as if Gregson recognizes the sound, as if he's familiar with it somehow. And that's making him appear extremely on edge. If that's the sense of the defense, my Nipponese friend, answer me this. Oh! Just what relevance do you pro just what relevance do you propose this woeful chiming has on this case? All right, I'll propose it when we when next time. <laughs> well, I, I'm bad at closing my episodes, but yes, we are out of time. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. As always, and we're gonna find out what this noise is. You probably, all of you probably know with a bit of a th thinking you probably would know what this is but anyways take care stay hopeful but be critical all right bye bye